read two passages if you want to find the same passage in your phone or on the hard copy you brought. I'll be uh, in Acts 14, and then the text I'll be reading from this morning, which is Ephesians 4. So two passages, go there real quick. Acts 14. Acts is written by Luke, who also wrote Luke. This is volume 2. It's called, in our words, the Acts of the Apostles. That's kind of right. It's the Acts of Peter, and then the Acts of Paul. That's how the book is divided up. And uh, what Peter does, he repeats what Jesus does. And Paul, in Acts, all the way from 13 to 28, does what Jesus does. So it's the Acts of Jesus Christ through Peter, and then through Paul. That's the book of the Acts, chapter 14, as well as uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Thank you, worship team. Great songs, good participation, great unity. God bless you for your work. Verse 8. It's uh, raining today. It's been raining uh, since I got up this morning, which is pretty early. Don't ask me how early I got up, but um, there's some rain mentioned in this passage, and I wanted to see how we should view rain. Not a curse, uh, but something else. In Lystra, sat a man who could not use his feet, lame from birth. That phrase is also used of the uh, person that Jesus healed, lame from his mother's womb, and the person that Peter healed, lame from his mother's womb. And now Paul does the same thing, heals a person who was lame from his mother's womb. Who had never walked. There's three phrases there to emphasize this dude never walked. The man was listening to Paul as he was speaking. And Paul stared intently at him and saw that he had faith to be healed. How do you see faith? Paul could see what I could not see. And he said with a loud voice, stand up on your feet. Sounds kind of cruel, doesn't it? <laughs> it's lame. Stand up. And the man leaped up and began to walk. And so when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in their language, Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. And so they gave names. They gave Barnabas, who was with Paul, Zeus, and Paul, Hermes, or I guess you could call it Hermes, or Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of the temple of Zeus, See the connection? Located just outside the city, brought bulls, that's not the Chicago bulls, and garlands to the city gates, because that's the uh, city hall. City gate is the city hall where transactions and court occurred. And he and the crowd wanted to, crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to these two gods, Paul and Barnabas. But uh, when the apostles noticed, Barnabas is called an apostle. He's not one of the twelve. And many people in the New Testament are called apostles, but they're not part of the original 12. Uh, but when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard about it, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd shouting, Men, why are you doing these things? We two are men with human natures, just like y'all. Paul was from Southern Asia. We are proclaiming good news. This is the word from which our word evangelist comes from, which is unfortunately never translated in our Bibles. Uh, the word evangelist is a transliteration and uh, English Bible that you have in your hand does a great job of hiding the meaning, just like it does with the word apostle and the word prophet. Those words are never translated, unfortunately. They should be. Guys didn't talk to me about it before they sat down to uh, do the translation. We are proclaiming good news to you that you, you should turn from these worthless things, Zeus, to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and everything is in them. In past times, past ages, God allowed all those nations to go their way. Yet, even though in past time he did not leave himself without a witness by doing tov, from the Hebrew, or good. That's related to the word gospel. By giving you what? Rain. Rain is what? Good. It's a gift, right? 
That's probably not what you thought this morning as you were driving here, right? With the window wipers going, rrr, 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 rrr. it's like this rain. Rain is a gift. From the skies and fruitful seasons. Yeah, your crops grow. God did that. Satisfying you with food and your hearts with joy. And even by saying these things, they scarcely persuaded the crowds not to offer sacrifices to them. Wow. Hmm. All right, let's go to Ephesians now. We are in a series on the book of Ephesians. And uh, last week we looked at the second paragraph in chapter 4. The Bible is not written verse by verse. It's written paragraph by paragraph. Every paragraph has one general thought. I therefore, the prisoner for the Lord, verse 1 of chapter 4, urge you to walk in a way that matches your calling, the calling with which you have been called. Here's how you do that. Here's how you walk worthy. Here's how you live in a way that matches the call of God in your life, with all humility, not just a little bit, all humility and gentleness and patience and then accommodating one another with all your mistakes in love, rooted in love, and then doing everything you can, using all of your strength and all of your resources and using your schedule, using your money to keep, to maintain, to preserve terreo, the unity provided by the Spirit in the chain link of peace. Here's the reason why. The whole trinity is based on unity and peace. There is one body, not two, Jew and Gentile. There's not three spirits. There's one spirit, just as you were called to one hope of your calling. Verse 5 focuses on the Son. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Verse 6 focuses on the Father. Notice he starts with the Spirit, then the Son, then the Father. One God, not two gods. One Father, not two dads. One Father of all, all Jews and Gentiles, who is over all Jews and Gentiles, and is through all, and in all. No exceptions. Now, but, notice the contrast. Unity, oneness, togetherness, oneness. But to each one of us, that's a change. Now we go from unity to variety. Each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of the gift. There's the word again. Of Christ. Therefore, it says, Psalm 68, when he, that's Christ, he's talking about how he gave gifts. Here he is. When he ascended on high, he captured prisoners. We'll talk about that today. Jesus Christ captured prisoners. He took POWs. And he gave gifts to people. The word give and gift is repeated again. He gave gifts to people. That's the spoils of war. When you win a victory, you give the spoils of war to your soldiers. But here he gives it not to soldiers, but to who? Prisoners. Now what is the meaning of he ascended except that he also descended to the lower regions? That is to say, to the earth. That's his ascent or descent, his incarnation, to become a human being. And he's the very one who descended the one who descended is also the one who ascended, there's the word again, ascended, go up above all the heavens in order to fill all the things. And it was he, verse 11, it was Christ, this ascended victor, the one who climbed back to Mount Zion, or was ascended to Mount Zion. He gave, there's the word again, that same verb, he gave, on the one hand, some as, and here's a word that never gets, never gets translated in our Bibles for some reason. To me, it's a crime. Apostle. It's, it's not a word. Our translators have made it up. They invented it. We'll talk about that today. Some as prophets. Again, the word prophet is a transliteration. That's where the translators make up a word that sounds like the Greek word. And as a result, it hides the meaning. The word apostle is hiding the meaning of what, what it means. And then some is evangelist. Here's another made-up word by our English translators. And all it does is produce confusion. Some as, and then literally, shepherds. Even though your English translation imports a Latin word, 
Pastor. It imports that word and sticks it into our English Bible. Dumb. There is one English translation today that has smartened up and is no longer following that old pattern. It's the ESV. Shepherds and teachers. Teachers is the only word that's actually translated. And their job is to bring saints to where they're supposed to be. To train them, train people, men and women, for the work of ministry, that is to say, to build up the body of Christ until what? Well, Jesus keeps giving these gifts through this church until we reach what? Unity of our faith, the faith, and of knowledge of the Son of God, a mature believer, a mature person, attaining to the measure of Christ's full stature. End of the reading. Yeah, I'm excited about going into it. But first, let's let the kids escape. And anybody else that wants to go with them, you may go. God bless you as you go. Thank you, teachers. Am I right in saying here before I pray that this Tuesday is Carlton Manor Night for the guys? Is that true? Yes. Yes. That's true. A comment about both women and men who are involved in Carlton Manor. When we understand that our families and our church families are places where biblical hospitality should occur, hospitality toward biological kids, adopted kids and foster kids, then we as God's people will have practical reasons and supernatural reasons to move children from hard places rather than retreating into our private little happy lives in this country. There are thousands of foster kids, thousands of kids in prisons, and God calls his people to take those kids out of hard places and place them in homes. Thank you, everybody who takes the time to visit girls on Thursday and boys on Tuesday at these foster homes who live in hard places. Let's pray. <clears throat> We've been prepared, Lord, to hear the voice of God through your gift, uh, the gift of music, theologically astute music, that is Christ-focused. It's not entertaining. It presents us Christ time after time after time, and his gift giving, his gifts of grace. We just rehearsed one particularly. We set our hope on Jesus. And so now that we have attention on you, we're listening to you, do what you want to do with us. We are yours. Do with us in our hearts what it needs to be done in every heart, every family, every young man or woman. Speak with the voice of the Spirit. Work with the power of the Spirit. Shun away darkness. Bring light. Bring hope. Bring salvation to the unbeliever. Invade like a D-Day. Crash through the barriers of their heart, whether erected by unbelief or confusion, or wounds, Lord, in vain. Set up your kingdom, your throne, your son in our lives afresh. And do it around the world, wherever the good news is preached. For Jesus' sake, I ask. For 22 years, uh, the state of Florida allowed us to visit a prison every week in South St. Pete, Department of Juvenile Justice. Many of you were part of that team every Tuesday, visiting young men who were incarcerated, ages 13 to 17 generally. And there's a few exceptions to and so we would bring speakers down to speak to the boys, all sorts of different people from the church and outside of the church. I uh, recently had contact with Judge Pierce, and he, I think, will eventually join us at Carl Manor. We'll, we'll see what happens. Our schedules conflict, but uh, 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 our worship team, or we have sort of many worship team down there, not the same one, and it was Andrea Bailey um, who was our worship leader. And, you know, Andrea, she was very enthusiastic. Being from Jamaica and loving music, 
she just let her rip and let it fly. And the guys really loved her. She connected with them, her race, and all that kind of thing. And uh, after one Sunday, I said, Andrea, um, would you like to uh, be our speaker one night? You could lead the worship and then speak. Open your Bible and, and teach them. She said, well, nobody's ever asked me to do that before, but okay, let me try it. So um, I, I kind of deal with fear and trepidation because I know that she had never taken an inductive Bible study. She sort of had been a Christian for many years, but um, I didn't know her level of reading the Bible and understanding how to read it and follow the argument of the passage. So I said, let's just have you teach. And you know, she preached something from the book of Proverbs, and it was um, unusual. <laughs> she was enthusiastic and forceful and energetic. And I thought, you know, there's, there's hope here because she's not afraid to stand up in front of people and talk. Most people don't like that. You ask them to speak in the front, and it's like asking them to go to the moon on their own energy. So um, I thought, let's try this again. Let me work with her a little bit on a passage, give her some homework, how to look for things in the text that the text actually says not bringing her meaning into the text, but taking the meaning out of it. And she did a phenomenal job. And then she gave an invitation. I suggested she do that. And I was surprised. Practically, the whole place came forward to trust Christ. <laughs> I thought, wow, did that just happen? And um, Sure enough, it happened. So I said, we got to put you in the schedule again on a regular basis because we only get to see these guys for six months. They're in prison for six months and they leave. So I lined her up again and guess what? The second time, she did the same thing with a little bit of Bible training and virtually everybody came to know Christ. And I thought, wait a minute. So afterwards I said, Andrea, and there she is at our home at Christmas. Oh with somebody that you may know. And I said, Andrew, has anybody ever told you that you might have the gift of evangelism or that you might be an evangelist spoken of in Ephesians 4, one of Jesus' gifts to the church? And she said, no, no one's ever told me that. No one's ever suggested that. And I said, I think, I think you are one of Jesus' gifts to the church. Every time you speak, I mean, you could read through the telephone book and people will come to pay. So let's try this again. And sure enough, same thing happened. And I said, Andrew, nobody has ever noticed this about you, but I am persuaded that Jesus still gives gifts to his church. He didn't stop at the end of the first century. He's still giving prophets and apostles and evangelists and shepherd teachers. Those are his gifts to the church. He's still the victor. He's still on the throne as the victor at Calvary. He's still giving gifts each generation. And I think you're one of them. <clears throat> well, she was really good in science and really good in math, and she thought she wanted to be a doctor. Okay, I said, well, you need to follow whatever you think God wants you to do. So she applied to medical school, got help, went to medical school. Near the end of the first semester, she called me, and she said, this ain't right. This is not me. I don't want to be a doctor. I'm not having any fun in medical school. <laughs> Even though she could do it. I mean, it's not that she was dumb. No, she was great at math, great in science, phenomenal. But she said, I'm just not happy. I'm not fulfilled. This is not what God wants me to do. I said, well, I have an idea for you. I said, have you ever considered going to grad school and learning how to expound the scriptures as an evangelist and share Christ, learning how to do that? She said, well, I think you talked to me about that one time before. I'll try. I'll apply. Can I use your name as a reference? Sure. She got accepted at Dallas Seminary. And that's where she is today, working on a two-year two MA, master's degree in evangelism and apologetics at Christmas time, she was just bubbling over with joy. She had found her net. She was a square peg in a square hole. What would have happened? Tell me, what would have happened if I had never observed her and never said something to her about what I was seeing about her abilities? 
What would have happened? Bored doctor. <laughs> Unhappy doctor. And she wouldn't know why she was so unhappy. She was good at it. I imagine she would make a fabulous doctor with her personality, her love of people, her outgoing. You know how Andrea is. I mean, she's just all over the place. She has more arms than an octopus, you know, and it all wraps all of them around you. But she's happy now. You know what? I bet no one here in this place ever expected in your church growing up that Jesus was continuing to give gifts to his church, the four different gifted leaders. And that we, as church people, ought to be looking, looking for them, and learning to spot them and then approach them and say, you know what, this is what I've seen about you. This is, but because I believe that he still does that, I was motivated to go to her and say, have you ever thought about that? She starts scratching her head, start thinking about it. But I bet no one here was raised in that kind of a church. And I hope that this church does that. I hope that you believe that Jesus still gives gifts and that some may be here and some may be your children and you don't know. What I'm going to do this morning is to do two things. As I read um, Ephesians 4 years ago, especially verses 7 through 11, that Jesus, when he ascended, after his victory at Calvary, when he ascended, Paul says he took prisoners of prisoners. Your Bible says he took captive, captivity, or captivity captive. That is to say, on his way up, he took prisoners who were prisoners, but he made them his prisoners. And then what? What's the text say immediately afterwards? He gave gifts to people. So he took someone who was a prisoner of darkness, and he made him his own prisoner, and then he gave that person who was a prisoner, he changed his life and gave him what? as a gift to the church. Now, who comes to your mind? Well, what does Paul call himself in chapter 4, verse 1? I call the what? The prisoner of the Lord. And how did that happen? Paul was captured by Jesus on the Damascus Road in Acts 9. Jesus took him prisoner. He had been a prisoner of darkness. Jesus took him prisoner. And then what did he do in Acts 9? He gave him as a gift to who? An apostle to the Gentiles. That's how he does it. So I thought, this is not the only time this has happened. I'm going to go through the Bible and see if this is a pattern all the way through. I want to see if this is a pattern where God on a mountain gives gifts to people. I said, I've never been taught that before. I didn't have a clue. But I started to go methodically through the Bible, and I found the pattern everywhere. So today... I'm going to quickly go through the Old Testament and give you examples of God on the mountain giving gifts through the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus on the mountain giving gifts. And then we'll come eventually, hopefully, before it starts raining again, to Ephesians 4 and, and talk about what that means for us here today. So the first thing I want to uh, show, make very clear, is that both Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, in the four Gospels, God gives gifts to his people. Let me begin. Where does the first story of the Bible begin? It begins on a mountain. Eden Mountain. And what does God do? Well, remember, the New Testament writers tell us that the person who's doing all the work in Genesis 1 is who? Who's doing all the work in Genesis 1 and 2? It's Jesus. John says that, Paul says that, the book of Hebrews says that the God that we are looking at unfold his will and creating the garden is the Son of God. What did he do from the mountain? Well, he gave Adam a bride. He gave Adam and his bride the gift of life and the gift of existence. He gave them a home to live in, a temple orchard, an orchard which is a temple. And that 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 orchard is viewed as, in the Hebrew Bible, a holy of holies. He gave them both kingship. The words that are used in our Hebrew Bible describe 
Eve as a queen and Adam as a king, both equal in their rule over the garden. He gave them both the priesthood, the ability to relate to God directly. Both of them are equal as priests. The Hebrew text makes it clear as rainwater that they are both priests. He gave them a banquet, all they could eat. Then, when they sinned, they were expelled from the mountain, no longer had access to the tree of life, and no longer had fellowship with God. That began the redemptive story of the Bible, to get us back on the mountain, to get us back in fellowship with the Son of God, to walk with God. And so what's the next story after they're expelled? The story of Noah on a mountain, right? And what does God give Noah on the mountain? What did he give him? A new start, a fresh start, a new beginning. How do we know that? Because the words that God said to Adam and Eve are identical to the words that he said to Noah. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Noah has a fresh start. What else did Noah get? He got a new diet, right? Now you can eat T-bone. Aren't you glad for that? Yes, now meat was on the table. And what else did God give Noah as a gift? What's the rainbow stand for? A covenant. So he had a fresh start on a mountain with a new diet and what? A new covenant. All right? Then, next story, Moses. A type of Adam and a type of Noah is on a mountain. <coughs> and what does God give to Israel through Moses? The law. And he gave him, he gave Israel a prophet. And he gave Israel a promise, Deuteronomy 18, that one day God would raise up a prophet who's just like Moses. And the people must listen to him. Well, in Luke 9, Jesus is on a mountain with Moses and Elijah. And the cloud appears and a voice comes and says, what? This is my son. What? Listen. The very words used in Deuteronomy 18, listen to him. That's the fulfillment of that promise. Then, when he's on a mountain, God gave the nation a group of people. They're called Levites. I'll read the text. Look, I have taken your brothers, the Levites, from among the children of Israel. To you they are given as a gift for the Lord, so the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. Let's go to some other mountains, because there's so many of them, I can't, I don't have time to talk about all the gifts from mountains. Just one that you're familiar with. On a mountain, Abigail, riding on in a presidential limousine, a donkey, gave David a meal. Gave him a chance to cool down and to think before he went to kill Nabal. Abigail is portrayed as a better Eve, and a better priest than Eve. She's a prophetess who speaks for God. So, they're a brief, uh, concentrated, summarized picture from the Old Testament of God giving gifts, not from a valley, but from a mountain. Now let's go to the Gospels, and because I don't have time to do Matthew and Mark and John, I'm just going to do Luke. And again, what's the pattern? What's the pattern? God giving gifts from a mountain, okay? I'm going to go to Luke. And by the way, this is a, a picture that's in reverse of what God does. Notice this story. The devil took Jesus to a high place, showed him all the kingdoms of the earth. And what did Satan say to Jesus? I will give you all their authority and splendor because it was given to me. And I can give it to anybody who wants. So if you'll bow down and worship me, it'll all be yours. Jesus doesn't take the bait. He knows that he has to visit Calvary first before all authority is given unto him. Then, in Luke chapter 6, verse 12 through 14, Jesus climbs a mountain and he prays all night long. And in the morning, what does he do? After an all-night prayer meeting on the mountain, what, is, what happens? He calls 12 of his disciples to become apostles. How did, he, how did he find out who they were supposed to be? The Father revealed the gift 
of insight to who they should be. Luke 6, 17. Jesus comes down the mountain after praying all night and calling his disciples. And what does he do? He graciously heals everybody from demons and from sickness. Then Jesus goes back up the mountain in Luke 9, verse 28. And out of the cloud, while Jesus is praying on the mountain, this is my son, listen to him. <coughs> Fulfillment of the prophecy from Deuteronomy 18. I'm skipping over uh, more examples of mountaintop, uh, mountaintop uh, scenes. But let me go to the last one in Luke. In Luke 23, Luke tells us that Jesus is led to a place called the place of the skull. In Latin, it's Calvario, translated as Calvary. What is a place of the skull? What is it? It's an elevated place, like our skull is an elevated place. So some sort of a hill-like, mountain-like structure. And what did he do on the cross? What gift did Jesus give on the cross on this mountain? Well, when a criminal said to be Remember me when you come into your kingdom. What did Jesus say? Today you'll be with me. Where? On the mountain. In paradise. Jesus gave the gift of salvation from mountain on the cross. So, pause. Bush pause for a minute. The pattern that Paul was talking about in Ephesians 4 is a pattern unfolded all the way through the Old Testament to get us ready for the ascension. And after Jesus' ascension, back to God's presence, back to the mountain, Mount Zion, what does he do? Well, Paul says, when he ascended on high, he gave what? Gifts to people. The word is anthropos, not males. He didn't give gifts to men. It says he gave gifts to people, men and women. Who are they? Well, I'm getting ahead of myself, but notice this. I'm going to skip over. When I go through Acts, I see mountaintop scenes, upper room scenes, and Jesus continues to give gifts all the way through. Now, um, even Ephesians has giving gifts from ascended places. But let me move to chapter 4. God gives four gifts. Remember, these are not offices. These are not church offices. These are not elders. Elders are never given to the church. They are appointed based on requirements. Deacons are not given as gifts to the church. They are appointed based on the requirements laid out in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. The church makes the mistake of conflating office and gift. None of the four gifts are ever described as offices. They're gifts given sovereignly by Jesus. Apostle, and we'll talk about this in the weeks to come, what the word apostle means. <coughs> Prophets, evangelists, and shepherd teachers. In the coming weeks, we'll talk about only just to say one little clue that it's so easy. The Greek word is apostolos. So what the translators have done is made up a word called apostle because it sounds like the Greek word. But they didn't translate it. But when our government, your government, gave a name to the people who carry messages to your house every day from somewhere else, what are they called? They're called postal workers, right? Where does that word come from? It comes from apostolos. What does a postal worker do? What does he do? Not me. I'm not authorized by the government to do it. I'm not a postal worker, male man or male woman. They bring messages authorized by or written by somebody else, and they bring them to you, to your mailbox. That's a hint about what an apostle is. It's someone who's authorized by a church, like, for example, uh, the Philippians, had an apostle that they sent to Paul. His name was Epaphroditus. The, the, the Bible text uses the word apostle to describe him, even though our English Bible 
uh, translate it correctly, by the way, as messenger. So we'll go through in the coming weeks what the meanings of these words are, but let's talk more about the fact that Jesus still is giving them. He gave first century church apostles. Silas, Timothy, Epaphroditus, Barnabas, Andronicus, and Junius, his wife, who is called an outst outstanding among the apostles. So Jesus gave from his throne in heaven gifts to the church, gifted leaders. One of them is a group called apostles. The second one is prophets. What is a prophet? Well, the story in 2 Kings 22 tells us what a prophet is. Under King Josiah, there were some workers who were working in the temple because it had been uh, years of, uh, of misuse, and they found a book, but they didn't know what the book was. So they came to the king and said, we don't know what this book is. And the king could have sent the workmen to Jeremiah, who was living in the city at the time, or Zephaniah, who was living in the city at the time. But he bypassed those two prophets, Jeremiah, Zephaniah, and he sent the workers to a woman, a prophetess named Huldah. And she confirmed that the book they found was the Torah, the law of God, the Pentateuch, Genesis through Deuteronomy. And so at the time, in the nation of Israel, there was no bias against women as spokesmen for God. There was no prejudice against women as a spokesperson who could speak on behalf of God. And then shepherd teachers. Um, Paul talks about these here in, in um, verse 11. Uh, it was he who gave some as apostolos, some as prophetas, others as luagelistas, and others as shepherd teachers. For what? Well, to equip and train people for the work of ministry until we all reach the unity of the faith. Has the church around the world reached the unity of faith? Any, any opinion on that? Has the church reached the, opinion, the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God? No. So how long should we expect Jesus to give these gifts? How long? Well, when we reach that. But as I look around the church, I see no unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. So he continues to give gifts. What are all four things, or what, what do all four gifted leaders do? They all are connected by what? The ministry of the Word. They all are involved in the ministry of the Word of God. They're gifts. They're not offices. So... Let's think about some uh, takeaways and then shut it down. The first takeaway that uh, comes to my mind is great expectations. If Jesus is still in heaven, as far as last I checked, he's still there. He hasn't come back yet. If he's still next to his father in a place of victory, and last I checked, he's still there, then he's still doing what, brothers and sisters? What's he still doing? He's still giving gifts. He's still Mr. Santa Claus. And every day is Christmas in Jesus' church, right? He's still giving gifts. And as I began, how many of you were raised to be expected in your church of Jesus' gifts being brought to our attention? I wasn't. And if you were, and you constantly were taught to be expected of Jesus, the gift giver, to do what he does best, then you're a rarity, and I want to talk to you afterwards. So he continues this pattern of gift giving, and we should therefore expect it. That's why when I saw Andrea, I thought, I wonder if she's the one. I wonder if she's one of them. And so I probed, I asked, I asked questions. Because I expected God to keep on giving. And it was that expectation that opened, <coughs> that opened my eyes and led me to say, Andrew, I want to chat with you a bit about you. <laughs> I guess the picture's not on the wall anymore. But her face, her heart, her soul is right exactly where it needs to be. Someday I'm going to see her open her Bible in very strange places. Places other people won't go. And she will share the word and people will get saved by the thousands. Do you expect that? 
Or would you prefer to be a Christian that says, nope, God's not giving these gifts anymore. Then how in the world are we going to have shepherd teachers in the generations to come? And if he continues to give shepherd teachers, why doesn't he give evangelists or prophets or people who take messages from one place to another? See how inconsistent that is? See how convenient it is to say, well, he gives these gifts, but he stopped giving the others. That's just fundamentally dishonest. And I ain't going there. <laughs> All right, let's think about it. <clears throat> who are some people who would qualify as an apostle that we know? Paul and Bethany. <laughs> Paul and Bethany. They are charged by God and a church to take the message of Christ to Haiti. That yeah, was kind of good for him because he was born in Haiti. <laughs> See, they're apostles. Now, today we use words like missionary, but did you know that the word missionary doesn't exist in the Bible? Doesn't exist. The word missio is a Latin word meaning to uh, send. And so that's kind of right. A missionary is someone who is sent. I mean, I don't know. I am a missionary kid. So someone who's sent with a message to go somewhere else and to cross borders, barrier breakers. That's, that's Paul Bethel for you. That's what comes to my mind. John and Susie. John and Susie, who will be here uh, in a few weeks. Absolutely, yeah. And then when we think of uh, an evangelist, which is just a word that we are dealing with here, obviously Andrew Bailey is an evangelist. And um, who comes to your mind as a prophetess or a prophet. Anna is called a prophetess and Agabus in the uh, Luke and Acts, they're called prophets or prophetesses. They're the ones who speak for God. They come into a situation and they provide direction and encouragement to people that you can't necessarily find in a page of the Bible. Who comes to your mind in our congregation or within your family or the church, who is one of these? Mary Busby. <clears throat> yeah. They're like John the Baptist, the prophet, who speaks in black and white. And sometimes they get into trouble. John the Baptist lost his head. But at least he didn't lose his faith. And then the question, who would be, who comes to your mind as someone who has the teaching gift but also has the shepherding gift at the same time? So these are words to think about. These are thoughts to think about. Do I expect that? How about your children? Does your children take care of pets and have a real shepherding gift for the pets, the dog, the cat, the geese, the monkey, whatever you have at home? Yes, I used to have a monkey. Uh, hard to shepherd them up, trust me, but, um, yeah, um, you know, it's monkey business, but, um, <laughs> did you know that's the first song I ever played in a piano, uh, uh, piano concert that I played? I played monkey business. Yeah, you'll find it in the John Sean book. All our family, I mean, we all had to play instruments, so we all had to play the piano. So thank the Lord that those days are gone. <laughs> So, uh, what if your kids left the gifts under the tree at Christmas, unwrapped, and they saw all those gifts and presents, and, eh, let's go play. What would you do? What would you do after you spent all that hour? What would you say? Hey, that's what's happening in our church. All over the place. God is sending gifts, and they're just under the tree, unwrapped. Who cares about these gifts? And you know what's worse? The church has invented roles, religious roles, that are not even in the Bible. It's like, church, what are you doing? Why are you inventing all of these leadership positions in the church? They're not found in the scripture. Why not take the ones that God is giving us and deal with them? But, you know, who am I to speak? Yeah, to me, it's just so ridiculous and so so counterproductive kind of thing. Dream one thing. Dream about this. What if every church in this nation started taking Ephesians 4.12 seriously and started looking for its gifts, evangelists that God sends, shepherd teachers, prophets, apostles, and started welcoming them, training them? What would happen to the church? 
Just dream that. Wouldn't that be great? You know what? I've been to a lot of churches in my life. I have never been in a church like that. This is the only church that I've ever been in that is open to receive the gifts that God wants to give. Every single church has put an iron lock on this. And I look at the churches and their conditions and I say, I get it. This is why they are so full of corruption, hard-hearted believers. 90% of the church sits and does nothing. I get it. If you would just be open to what the Bible has to say and do it. It's like, wow, what a novel thought. <laughs> All right. What I'm trying to say this morning is a reflection, I hope, of the scriptures. That God on his mountain gave gifts. And the plan went down the tubes because a couple of people failed to trust his word. So God clicked into gear a redemptive program that includes a rebound of mountains giving gift, God giving gifts from the mountain to people for their benefit, for their health, for their life, for their redemption. And the story of the Bible is the story of one mountain after the next. And the, the one who finally provided the solution is the one who visited Calvary. He descended, died on behalf of the foolish mistakes of people, sinners, and then went back to heaven on the throne and started, <coughs> started telling us with gifts. And he's still doing that. And I wonder if you're one. I wonder if one of you is a gift. And you've never thought about it. You've never thought about that maybe you are a gift than Jesus. Do you like to bring the message of Christ beyond warrior, barriers? And may I say, by the way, the people that go to see him, Carlton Meta, every week, you're an apostle. You're carrying the message of Christ across an unusual border. You're an apostle. But I'm wondering if there's people here who want to do that in Siberia, or feel called to the Philippines, or somewhere else. You would be a gift. We need to unwrap you. Are you someone who likes to share Jesus everywhere you go? At work, at home, in your neighborhood? Maybe. Are you a prophet? You like to speak for God? <laughs> when everyone else is cowering in silence? Or do you have a shepherding gift? Do you like to take care of things? Do you like to take care of people and train them to do things? Maybe you're one of the gifts that Jesus has given. And if they're gifts of grace, we treat you with respect and love and affirmation. And we say, praise God for you. Thank you, Lord, for the gifts that you give us. Thanks for listening this morning. I think it's time to do some praying. Stand and pray with me, please. The phrase, uh, what gift of grace, which is a phrase we rehearsed today in song, is Jesus my Redeemer. How can we not give you thanks? How can we not give you thanks? for this great gift of our Redeemer, the gift of the Holy Spirit, undeserved, but life-giving. Open our eyes to see the gifts in our church here that you've given to us. And rather than cowering in fear and going against tradition, give us boldness to affirm and encourage the people that might be gifts. For the person here who is a gift to the church and doesn't know it, reveal it to them. Yeah. Open their eyes. Open their eyes to see a better view of themselves. Give eyes to moms and dads to see their children in a new light. Take, give them time to look and study their kids. To observe them their behavior, their words, their tendencies, their habits. And bring us gifts, Lord, that we will be willing to recognize and then employ here for the sake of your kingdom, the sake of the body of Christ. And may this truth sweep across the world. Start here, Lord, if you need to. Help us, we need 
your help but desperately. For the glory of God, and in the name of the Son, I pray. Amen. Jesus in Luke 24 raised his hands just before he ascended to heaven to bless. Why did he raise his hands? Why does Luke say that he lifted up his hands and he blessed? He didn't pray for them, he blessed them. Why would he raise his hands in the blessing? Why did the high priest bless the people in the exact same way? Why, why not like this? Why not like this? Or like this? Why this way? Why did he lift his hands up? Well, where was he headed? Where was Jesus headed? He, I mean, the ascension occurs in the next verse, right? He's pointing to where he's headed. So if you're headed there, is that where you're headed? I encourage you to lift your hands. And now may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit surround you, keep you, and bring you back. Until we meet again, let God's people say, Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. <coughs>